I'm Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. Welcome everybody to another edition of Miracle Voices. I am Matthew McCabe and I'm pleased to welcome my co-host Judy Scutch Whitson. Hi Judy, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Matt, and I'm really excited about this podcast, too. I think we're going to have such a good time. Me, too. And I'm so happy that we have Gary Renard here on the podcast with us. Gary, welcome to Miracle Voices. Oh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. You know, to me, uh, Judy is like the mother figure of The Course in Miracles, and I'm just honored uh, to be here and to be able to have this conversation today. Uh Uh-oh, what's after mother? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, immediately irreverent (laughs) (laughs) well we certainly go back a long time in in love and respect and i certainly am much older so i guess i think i'm more of a grandmother figure now (laughs) well either way uh, you've always been so uh kind to me and i really do appreciate so thank you for that you're easy to be kind to sweetie Well, Judy's already had a joke here, Gary. She beat you to it. You usually start with a joke. Do you have a joke for us today? (laughs) Uh, Well, that's true. Uh, You know, I was at uh, Yellowstone National Park recently, and I heard this joke. And uh, it's only about two minutes, so I'll give it to you. uh, This guy is uh, walking in Yellowstone, and he's hiking by himself, which you shouldn't do. Uh, And he's, he's by himself, and he comes across this big grizzly bear. And he does uh, exactly what you shouldn't do in that situation. He starts to run away. And right away, the bear starts uh, chasing him because the guy's terrified and he's running. And uh, after a while, he's surprised at how fast this bear can run. And he realizes that he's not going to outrun this grizzly bear. And he's really scared. And he just yells out to God. And he says, God, God, please save me. Please save me. And this voice comes out of the sky. And the voice says, huh, uh, you never talked to me before. Uh, What, now you're going to die? And all of a sudden, I'm your friend? And the guy says, oh, God, you're right. You're right. I never talked to you. I don't deserve to talk to you. I don't deserve to be in your presence. I don't even deserve to be a Christian. But hey, I've got an idea. Make the bear a Christian. Okay, turn the bear into a Christian. And the voice says, huh, you know, that's actually a very interesting idea. Uh, Okay, it's done. The bear is a Christian. And in a few seconds, you are going to see a miracle. And the guy falls down. He turns around and the bear is right on top of him. It looks like the bear is going to claw him to death. And the guy yells out, where's the miracle? Where's the miracle? And then the miracle happens. The bear speaks, and the bear says, thank you, Lord, for the food I'm about to receive. Oh, Oh, I don't even want to think about that way before I go to sleep. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That's a funny one, Gary. Well, Gary... Many listeners know you as the author of the book, The Disappearance of the Universe, The Lifetime When Jesus and Buddha Were Friends, and Your Immortal Reality. But for new listeners, can you give us an overview of your background and journey, how the course came into your life and what you were doing before it did? Sure. And uh, let's not forget, well, this forgot no one, which is my fourth. Okay. Yeah, but it was my third, but it doesn't matter. And okay. uh, I'm working on two books right now. Um uh, doing one with my wife, Cindy, and that's about relationships. And I think that will be out in October. And then for next year, I'm shooting for my fifth book with uh, Arkin and Persa, my teachers. And, uh, you know, speaking of them, you may or may not know that I was introduced to the course in a very unconventional 
way. And uh, I usually save that story for my workshops because it takes a long time. But I don't consider myself to be the teacher in my books. I, I consider myself uh, to be the student. And the teachers in my books, I consider to be the Holy Spirit. And art and person, my teachers are simply manifestations of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like uh, we hear the voice of Jesus in the course, but it's really the Holy Spirit because Jesus is out of here. You know, he's not coming back. And uh, that's what the Holy Spirit wants for all of us. The Holy Spirit wants all of us to go home. And so art and person aren't really art and person. They're, they're images that are appearing, that are representing uh, the Holy Spirit in my books. And I didn't know that at first. I didn't have a clue because I knew <laughs> really nothing uh, about the course. And this all started at the very end of 1992. And I still remember the date. It was uh, December the 21st, yeah, which happens to be the feast day for St. Thomas. And uh, they said that they'd be back about a week later. I didn't know if I believed them or not. I thought that maybe I'd been meditating too much because uh, I was sober, so I knew it, what that wasn't the problem. And it was like, uh, what's going on here? But they did show up a week later, and they explained uh, a lot more to me in that second visit. And uh, what happened was that over a period of about 10 years, uh, they taught me uh, things from A Course in Miracles that resulted in the book, The Disappearance of the Universe. It took me uh, 10 years to do. And I think that I was deliberate on their part because they wanted to give me time uh, in between their visits to kind of like uh, digest what they had taught me and actually apply it uh, to my life, which I didn't find easy, but uh, I did the best I could. And after about 10 years, the book was ready and they told me what to do with it. You know, I didn't know that I didn't, didn't have a sucker's chance in hell of that book being published, but uh, they told me exactly who to bring it to. And uh, his name is D. Patrick Miller, but they said, don't tell him that we said that he's gonna publish it or else he won't. So it has to be his idea, right? So after a while, uh, he read it, he wrote back to me and he said, hey, I, you know, I think you've got something here. And uh, I said, oh, really, really? And, and he said, you know, but no one's gonna publish this. And he said, so I'll publish it. And I said, well, I, what a good idea, Patrick. <laughs> you know, and uh, so he did. and. Uh, you know, it started to catch on. And it met a lot of resistance at first, not among uh, what I would call the loving uh, A Course in Miracles students, of which there are so many, <clears throat> but there are a few people in the crowd who were very judgmental and uh, were not very kind. And that was one of my first big forgiveness opportunities because I expected everybody to just embrace me as a brother who was sharing his experience with people but it didn't always turn out to be that. And so that was the first uh, big forgiveness opportunity for me. And I recorded uh, you know, a lot of uh, things and tried to put them out there. And sometimes they were met uh, by very friendly people and sometimes they weren't, but that was a, a forgiveness opportunity that I had to go through. And looking back on it, I'm glad I did. I didn't always enjoy it at the time, but uh, as things progressed, more and more people in the course community started to read the book and many people embraced it. And uh, that's when I started to get a lot of love. And I think that's been getting stronger and stronger ever since. And uh, you know, I started doing the course uh, almost 30 years ago now. And uh, I think that today I feel you know, more loved and uh, get more kindness from people than I ever have. So uh, that's gone in a very good direction as the years Gary, may I may I jump in here and say something sure. uh, before the time has passed for me to say it? Uh, earlier on, in the beginning, you sent the completed manuscript to Ken Wapnick and to me. Yes. And um, I read it right away, and Ken read it right away, and we called each other up to confer. Now, what... I was going to ask Ken because I tremendously respected his knowledge of the course. He was, let's say, my appointed baby brother by Helen, and we did a lot together. We were on the same board of directors of the foundation, and 
uh, he made decisions for his organization and we made decisions for our organization, but it was a very close, close relationship. And I said, Ken, did you read this manuscript? And he said, yes. And I was sure that because it was not pure Course in Miracles, because here we have Artists of Persimmon in it. I said, what did you think of it? He said, you know, Judy, I read it through twice and I couldn't find one thing wrong about A Course in Miracles. He's got it down perfectly. And I gave a big sigh of relief because I had come from a field of uh, actual experimentation and research in parapsychology and beings popping out from no place was pretty common. So (laughs) I was so delighted that my partner, my brother Ken, found absolutely nothing to complain about in this book. And we said, wow, here's a winner. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's great to hear and it makes me feel very good uh i met oh, ken in roscoe new york uh about twice before that and i was nervous uh the first time and he knew it and i'll never forget how kind he was to me and he didn't have to be you know if he'd been annoyed with me you know pestering him about my book uh that would have been fine with me i, I would have accepted it but it was just the opposite. You know, he was so good to me and so kind. And I, I did go out of my way to explain to him that I was crediting the course the way that it should be credited. I was doing an index. And I think he liked the fact that I was given the course uh, the proper credit that it deserved because there were people at the time who were not uh, doing that. And, uh, you know, we kind of like got off on the right foot. And I think that uh, when he read the book, uh, he realized I was doing my best. And, and so he was always very good to me. And, uh, you know, the way that you treated me and Ken, and of course, Wit also, uh, you know, that's always been a, a very, you know, happy part of my life that, you know, you just kind of like were so nice to me. And even Ken was too. And if anybody uh, is going to find, you know, something that you did wrong about the course, it would be Ken. Right. But uh, he, he thought it was good. And, and that, you know, gave me a little more confidence because I was, you know, very, very shy uh, at that time. And actually, I still am, but uh, I have managed through forgiveness uh, to be able to get out there and speak in front of people. In fact, I refused to speak in public the first uh, six months that the book was out. And then finally, D. Patrick Miller said to me, he said, look, Gary, people have uh, questions about the book. And if you don't answer those questions, they're going to make up their own answers. You know, so it might be, uh, you know, to your advantage to just, you know, get out and answer some questions. And I was uh, terrified. But I went and uh, I did my first workshop. And I remember I got out there and all I saw was all these eyeballs. You know, all these eyeballs were staring at me. It was like attack of the killer eyeballs. (laughs) And I didn't know if I could speak. I didn't know if I could uh, continue. And thank God, I have a good memory. And uh, I remember these words from the course, which we all know, but uh, you know, I, I said them out loud. And of course, they're very early in the text on page uh, 28. And I just said these words, uh, which I think were originally intended to help Bill, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but I remember them and I said, I am here only to be truly helpful. You know, I'm here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. And I said those words and I felt different. Now, I, I wasn't alone. You know, I had forgotten to ask the Holy Spirit uh, to help me before I went out there. But I never forgot that again. <laughs> and uh, I always remember to put the Holy Spirit in charge of my whole day and, and whenever I sleep. And uh, I felt like I wasn't alone because now it wasn't my responsibility. I don't have to worry about what to say or what to do because now it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. And my teachers actually told me that about the book, the first book. Uh, Gary, the book is not your responsibility. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. 
and uh, that has served me well. And uh, so, you know, from that point on, I, I started to get a little more comfortable, you know, speaking in front of people. And uh, today, I very seldom get nervous. In fact, I was more nervous this morning talking to you than I usually am <laughs> walking out in front of hundreds of people <laughs> and speaking because I just, you know, consider you to be like an icon. But, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to make you special. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, that's kind of like a fact. And uh, so that that's why, you know, I will get nervous if I'm doing something different, you know, something that I haven't done before. And uh, that's okay, because that's how you understand that this applies equally, you know, to everyone. And in the back of my mind, I can remember that there is no order of difficulty in miracles. You know, one is not harder or bigger than another, which is the conclusion that I came to at the end of the book, uh, The Disappearance of the Universe, because the last visit of that book was when 9-11 uh, had just happened, and I saw the World Trade Center come down, and I felt like crying. But then I remembered that there is no order of difficulty in miracles, and that can be a little hard uh, to apply when you see uh, such a, a tragedy unfolding. And yet, if I believe uh, the Course, and I do believe the Course, then I can think of those people as being who they really are and what they really are, which is a divine creation of God. It is actually the same as God, because God doesn't do different. You know, God does perfect oneness, which is the awareness of heaven. And so in the back of my mind, I can overlook the bodies, and I can think of people as being uh, exactly the same as God. And if what the Course says is true, that as you see him, you will see yourself, and it is true, then I know that I will come to experience myself that way, if I see them that way. And then I still, you know, have my doubts. And I think that uh, I even heard Witt say this once. Uh, he was asking, you know, what kind of a person am I becoming if I don't feel bad when these terrible things happen? And uh, I asked that question also, and the answer I got uh, from Jesus, because, you know, people think I talked to art and person in my mind or the Holy Spirit. I actually uh, talked to Jesus, and I have ever since I was a child. And I wasn't a churchgoer. You know, I wasn't religious. You know, we would go to church uh, twice a year, you know, uh, Easter and Thanksgiving. And uh, I couldn't buy what they were saying about Jesus in the church. But I would talk to him in my mind. I felt like uh, he was my friend. And I felt like I could talk to him and he would help me and advise me. And uh, I couldn't buy into Christianity, but I, I never gave up on that relationship. I did know him uh, 2,000 years ago, and we were friends. And that's why uh, you know, I felt like he was my friend. It, it went back a long way, as it turned out. So... Uh, I've always had that relationship. And when uh, I got to Maine in the early 1990s, I had been a professional musician. And I got there and I was looking for what I was going to do next because I knew that I didn't want to be a professional musician anymore. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but I had been there and done that for 25 years. And uh, I was looking for something else. And I hoped that somehow it would be connected to this relationship that I felt with Jesus. And it turned out that it was connected. And I had never heard of A Course in Miracles until the end of 1992. I was into this thing called EST, which was very good for me at the time, but they didn't talk about A Course in Miracles. So uh, when I finally you know, saw the course, and especially after that second visit from Art and Persa, I started to realize, okay, I found it. You know, I want to share the course with people for the rest of my life somehow. And then eventually they told me, well, we're doing a book, you know, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> and uh, so I realized that that's how it was going to start. But I had no idea what was going to happen uh, after that. For all I knew, you know, it would be possible that nobody would read it. And I would have worked on it for 10 years uh, anyway, even if nobody read it, because I realized that it was also for me you know, that I was the one who was learning these things that they were saying to me first. And then maybe later they would want me to share it with people in some way. And uh, it did work out that way. And I did start speaking and I was able to forgive it. 
And, uh, you know, this uh, reminds me, uh, because we were talking about, you know, forgiveness lessons and opportunities. And uh, there was another big one that I don't think I've ever told anybody about. But uh, I mentioned that I have a good memory. <clears throat> well, actually, I have uh, an excellent memory. But that can be a good thing because, you know, it can help you learn things. And it certainly helped me with learning the course. But, and I'm still learning, but uh, at the same time, it can also be a curse because I used to remember every bad thing that anybody ever said to me, you know, uh, any insult, any uh, negative thing. And as a musician, I got to work with uh, some people who could be uh, big egos and very negative at times and very critical at times. And uh, even before that, I was bullied in school. And, you know, I would remember, you know, all these bad memories. And it was very difficult for me until I realized, you know, there's this great workbook lesson, which we all know, uh, number 23. You know, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Now, I had thought to apply this, you know, to uh, today, you know, to the here and now. And it includes whether you think of judging someone, because even a judgment is an attack thought. So if you, uh, you know, think of judging someone or they're judging you, you let go of that. You practice the Course's brand of forgiveness. If I could say uh, one thing <clears throat> about the Course's brand of forgiveness, it's don't make it real. You know, you're not forgiving it because it really happened. You're forgiving it because it didn't happen because as the Course is so consistent right from the beginning. You know, what we're seeing is not true. So we're not forgiving it because it really happened. Now, I took that uh, lesson, number 23, and when I would have one of these bad memories, <clears throat> I started to apply that to the bad memory and realized that that was an attack thought and that my ego was trying to trick me into not enjoying today. And by the way, I, I found it helpful later to put that workbook lesson together with uh, workbook lesson number 289. You know, the past is over. You can touch me, not. And uh, I kind of like put those things together. And whenever I had one of these bad memories of, of being uh, bullied or being verbally abused later, uh, whenever I had one of those bad memories that upset me, I would apply that lesson to that memory you know, from the past. <clears throat> and those memories started to disappear. And not only that, but I was actually astounded later to realize that I was having different memories. Like I would think of that person and maybe there was a time when that person complimented me or said something nice to me and said, hey, you're a great guitar player or, or something like that. And I would remember that instead. So it was kind of like without consciously uh, doing it, I realized that I was uh, employing what the course calls selective remembering, where you actually remember something loving from the past or as close to love as that person could get. And you would remember the good things instead of the bad things. And uh, that may sound a little uh, simplistic, but it does wonders for your peace of mind. So uh, I actually found myself having different memories simply by applying these lessons to those bad memories from the past. They were eventually replaced by other memories most of the time. And if not, at least they were forgiven. And so that has made a real difference to me. And I don't think that I put that in any of my books yet or, or really said that. Gary, you touched upon something that I, I am so immersed in trying to keep in my mind and practice now that I just gasped when you said it. Actually, the Course tells us, and this is where you got it, <laughs> to forgive is merely to remember only the loving thoughts you gave in the past and those that were given you. All the rest must be forgotten. Forgiveness is a selective remembering based not on your selection. And I think the operative last phrase there is it's based not on our selection. We, we can't do that. We're too invested in the past and what she said to me and how he hurt my feelings and the awful thing that happened to me in the grocery store. But to say to the Holy Spirit, 
I want to be in a forgiveness mode for the rest of my life. Please guide me through it. Please help me. Please show me. Please tell me what to stay. You're here only to be truly helpful. All the things that are meaningful to you from what you've studied in the course and remembering that unless we give it to the Holy Spirit, unless we turn it over to our higher selves, unless we ask the voice for God to be the arbiter, to be the decision maker, then the help isn't strong at all and it doesn't stick. But if we're asking the Holy Spirit constantly, you know better than I, you know what thoughts to help me let go of and forget, you know what thoughts to help me remember, you will guide me into really seeing who this person is, which is myself. Then you can be sure in every case, forgiveness is going to happen. Uh, absolutely. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing that. And, uh, yeah, I, I found that the most uh, difficult areas for me to apply the course to have been uh, two I've already mentioned. Another one is uh, politics. And I'm certainly not going to get into politics here. But uh, I did find that that was a very difficult thing for me to forgive because I was kind of raised on politics. And I grew up in uh, Massachusetts. And, you know, John F. Kennedy was my hero when I was nine years old and he was running for president. And of course I was devastated when, when he was killed. And uh, I guess most of my life I've had to forgive politics. And that hasn't been easy for me. When that politician used to come on the TV screen who I couldn't stand, you know, I'd want to go, <clears throat> you know, like react. And that is so easy to fall into. And uh, I think the hardest part sometimes of doing this is just stopping yourself and remembering the Holy Spirit instead, you know, choosing the right teacher instead of the wrong teacher. Because the second that I do that, uh, the second that I remember the truth, I'm at peace. And I used to think at first, you know, because, you know, this, the course is something that you grow into. And I used to think, okay, peace, big deal. What's that going to get me? You know, because I was into the self-help movement. And, you know, I wasn't sure that I wanted something that didn't get me anything. But after a while, I realized, well, wait a minute, something's happening here, because the more peaceful I become, the more open I am to inspiration. And as you know, about the word inspired comes from the words in spirit. Uh, the more in spirit my mind is, the more open I am to these inspired ideas that can come to you from the Holy Spirit. And those ideas can be very practical. You know, like uh, in the Song of Prayer section, it talks about the echoes of God's love. Now, of course, the real Song of Prayer is love, you know, and you get lost in God's love. And I do that. But I have found also that afterwards comes what the Course calls the harmonics, the overtones, uh, the echoes of God's love. And I believe that sometimes those echoes of God's love will come to us from the Holy Spirit uh, in the form of an inspired idea. You know, so you may be doing something. And as I said, it can be very practical. You may be trying to uh, start a business or something, and you can't quite make it work. You know, you can't think of uh, how you're going to make it. And you may be doing nothing special. Maybe you're uh, sitting around having lunch or something. And an idea will just pop into your mind. And it doesn't feel like it was your idea. You know, it feels like it came from someplace else, like, you know, you ever talk to somebody and they do something uh, really great and you'll say, wow, that was a great idea. You know, how'd you think of that? And they'll say, well, it just came to me. Well, that's what an in inspired idea is like, you know, it just comes to you seemingly from out of nowhere. And when I get that kind of an idea, I pay attention because I've used it in the past and it has worked very well for me. You know, I never thought that I would leave New England. I never thought that I would be living in California with this beautiful woman in Hollywood and, you know, having the Hollywood experience and, uh, you know, meeting all these great people and everything. I, I wouldn't have dreamed of that. I never thought that I'd, I'd leave uh, Maine or Massachusetts. And uh, yet I received very strong guidance about 14 years ago that it was time to leave. You know, it was time to come out here and to be with Cindy. And that decision has been one of the happiest decisions of my life. And I, I'm really glad that I did it. And I don't think I would have had the nerve to do it if I didn't really feel like it was coming from the Holy Spirit. But I did feel that way. And it has worked out. 
And, you know, I've been trying to get my books uh, made into a TV series. And that's been uh, very difficult. And, uh, you know, it, first of all, if you do anything connected with spirituality, uh, unless you're a mainstream Christian and you got one of those uh, TV series like the Bible or Jesus, which have done very well, uh, the more esoteric type spiritual, uh, what I call a dramedy, because a lot of it involves my life story, uh, I found that very difficult to sell because there have been quite a few series that have tried to do that in the last few years, and none of them have done very well. Uh, usually they're over within two years. And so the network executives in the studios are a little leery about uh, doing something different and something that, especially if it involves any kind of spirituality. But at the same time, we keep trying. Now, that's okay. I figure one of two things is going to happen. Uh, I'll either get the series and uh, be careful what you ask for, because if you get a TV series, that becomes your life. <laughs> it takes so much time if you're going to be in charge. And, uh, you know, so who knows? Uh, maybe I'm better off without it. But if I don't get it, well, then I have another uh, forgiveness opportunity. It's just like the book. You know, there was a chance when I did that book, The Disparity of the Universe, that it would have ended up gathering dust on a bookshelf in Maine. And it would have just been another big forgiveness lesson, except I would have learned so much from that book. And I really think that Arden and Purse would have done that just for me, you know, because even if it didn't go anywhere, it would have helped me. But it's the same with the TV series. I mean, if it happens, great. If not, I'll forgive it. And maybe my big uh, consolation prize would be I'll move to Hawaii and have a good time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, either way, I'm going to win. It's just that uh, I'm kind of like waiting to see, you know, uh, am I, you know, just barking up uh, the wrong tree here? But the guidance I get is that you should try anyway, because if you didn't, then you'd always wish that you did. So uh, even if that doesn't work out, either way, I, I can just see that uh, I'm going to win. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will lead you to a win-win uh, situation where the Holy Spirit is, uh, you know, having your best interests at heart, because we don't know what our own best interests are. We just think that we do. But we definitely know that the ego does not have our best interests at heart. So uh, that's why I always try to listen to the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I'm 100% successful, but I, I do always try to listen to the Holy Spirit and put the Holy Spirit in charge every day and uh, join with God and get my mind into a forgiveness mode where I'm ready to forgive. You know, that kind of uh, miracle readiness that the Course talks about, where you're ready to forgive. And it doesn't even matter what happens anymore. No matter what it is, uh, you know it's all the same. And it's all equally forgivable because none of it is true. Gary, you said that you had a couple of forgiveness stories that you might like to share the specifics of. Um, do you feel like doing that? Well, uh, sure. I mean, I, I've already done a couple of them, but, um, well, this is kind of personal, but I don't think that Cindy would mind me. Kind of personal is the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> lately, you know, uh, Cindy's gone into this mode where she doesn't really feel like going out and doing workshops very much uh, anymore. Now, I don't know if it was the pandemic and she got used to being at home or because she got into writing so much. Uh, she's already written two books in uh, the last couple of years and she's doing this one with me and then she's gonna do another one. And I think she really wants to be more of a writer than a speaker, even though she's very good at speaking. And we do these online uh, classes together twice a month. And I think she's very good uh, at that. But I still feel like getting out there. And because uh, Cindy started doing workshops with me for, uh, well, at least three or four years, people now kind of expect her uh, to come with me, but now she doesn't want to. You know, so I'm getting inquiries for workshops where they want both me and Cindy. And, you know, maybe they want me uh, to, and, and some of them do, but it's just that I had quite a, a resistance to Cindy, you know, coming and doing workshops with me and then all of a sudden not doing it and making it seemingly more difficult uh, for me you know, to line things up because some people want both of us 
and some people are very happy with just me coming. So I really had to forgive her for that because I, I thought like, look, I let you into my workshop world, so to speak, and you wanted it. You acted like you wanted it, and then you got it. And then once you got it, once people expected you to be there, all of a sudden you're not there. And uh, that turned out to be a very personal uh, forgiveness lesson for me. And I did get quite annoyed with her. I, I don't think I've ever actually gotten angry at her. And aside from that, I don't feel like we have a lot to forgive with each other. Uh, so our next book will be you know, partially about our forgiveness lessons with each other, but more about uh, you know, relationships in particular and how to make the most of your relationship. And uh, we're not going to have a lot of these personal forgiveness lessons because we just don't have any. But uh, that has been a big one for me. I, I have had to forgive her for not wanting to come with me to these places. I went to Mexico uh, by myself, you know, and I'll be going to uh, North Carolina by myself. And do you and feel really peaceful? Do you feel peaceful about that now? Uh, I think. So I, I don't think I'll know until the next time I go out. <laughs> but <laughs> I do I do feel like I'm uh, forgiving it. And I do feel peaceful. And uh, traveling, you know, isn't as much fun as it used to be. You know, things have gotten just way too restrictive and understandably so. And then to not have her there with me, because it's a lot more fun, I think, to travel uh, with somebody than by yourself. And uh, so, you know, it, it has been a little bit more difficult for me. And maybe it is still a forgiveness. Lesson. But the but the thing that brings up me listening to your story, which is so common in so many ways to all of us, we're always in relationship. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's a wife or a husband, a child, a student, a boss. We're in relationships. Courses about relationships. And one of the things I found really helpful, but very hard, is to let go of all expectations. Mm. To absolutely say, I do not know what anything is for. Please show me. I expect nothing from this. And then I feel much freer. And then what evolves is usually something far superior than I could have dreamt about myself. Well, yeah, that's great. In fact, I, I just wrote that down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've never actually thought of those words, you know, that I expect uh, nothing and if you don't expect anything, well, then you're not going to be disappointed, are you? Exactly. So uh, that's that's something that I think is going to help me. So thank you. Unless you feel like you have an expectation that you should let go of your expectations, in which case <laughs> <laughs> we'll just start a loop here right now. <laughs> oh, it's tricky. <laughs> uh, speaking of relationships, I have a very quick joke. This only took a minute. Okay. Uh, there are these four ladies in a retirement community in Arizona, and they're not doing anything special. You know, they, they're just playing cards. And a new guy comes in. You know, this new guy, you know, he's kind of good looking, so, you know, they're interested in him. And the first lady says to the guy, she says, hey, uh, you're new here. Obviously, you're retired. What did you do for a living? And he says, look, ladies, uh, I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I actually spent the last 25 years in prison. And the second lady says, wow, what were you in prison for? He says, oh, murder. The, the third woman says, oh, who did you kill? He says, look, ladies, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to exaggerate or anything. I'm going to tell you the truth. I killed my wife. And the fourth woman says to him, she says, so, you're single. <laughs> 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 Love it. <laughs> now, you know, uh, we have uh, a gathering in our foundation every Friday for those who want to be part of it, who work. I together. know. I saw the last one. Oh, I'm glad. And some of us never even knew each other or would never see each other if we hadn't just joined together. When we knew not what, except we wanted to be in friendship with people who were helping each other. And we had some wonderful volunteers that the people who were working with the volunteers knew, but the rest of us didn't even know them or know their names. So we just started this unofficial group. And what I have learned in that 
is that some of the most wonderful shifts in perception occur with strangers that you've never met and you feel therefore no uh, predisposition or obligation to be anything other than you are. And you find out lo and behold, that this stranger suffers from or has the same difficulties you have, whether it's with a member of the family or relationship or pain. And we were stunned a few weeks ago to find out how many people were hiding their physical pain and some were even ashamed to have it because of course in miracles is not about the body. It's about spirit with all misperceptions and warped ideas about what we should or shouldn't be or what thoughts we should hold or shouldn't hold. And I'm thinking that the more candid we become with each other, if we say I murdered my wife, you know, <laughs> you can come up with something that is a positive help in the way you perceive. So uh, I like that show particularly well because it reminds me of telling each other maybe our deepest, darkest secrets that we don't want to be judged by and finding out not only are you not judged, but there are people who share the same secret and you can be on the way to letting it go together. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, I'm also glad that you mentioned uh, the subject of pain, because there are course students that I've met also, and Cindy does conference one sessions, and, and I used to. I, I just didn't really uh, love it as much as Cindy did. I did a couple of hundred, but Cindy's done, I think, thousands. And, uh, you know, so many people are in pain, as you say, and it reminds me of, uh, you know, something that appears very early in the text, uh, because, you know, Students sometimes feel guilty if they, you know, seek uh, medical help or, or take medicine or things like that because the Course calls it uh, magic. But you notice that the Course doesn't say that you shouldn't use magic. It, it just wants you to be clear that it's your mind that decides to get sick and it's your mind that decides to get well. But if you look very early uh, in the text, you know, it says right here, you know, sometimes the illness has a sufficiently strong hold over the mind to render a person temporarily inaccessible to the atonement. Uh, in this case, it may be wise to utilize a compromise approach to mind the end body, in which something from the outside is temporarily given healing belief. And I really think the reason that uh, Jesus put that in there is because he didn't want course students dying uh, because they're not taking their medicine or they're not seeking treatment. And I've had two close friends uh, who had cancer uh, and they were both core students and they didn't seek treatment and they thought they could heal it with just their mind. And uh, they're both no longer with us. And uh, I tell students, look, you know, it really reminds me of something that uh, Ken used to say. He used to say, uh, don't forget how to be normal. You know, you get sick, you go to see a doctor or you, or you seek some kind of treatment. It doesn't have to be traditional if that's not what you believe in. But, you know, find something that you feel guided to or that you believe in and seek the treatment or seek the right medicine. And yes, of course, use your mind at the same time uh, to try to heal the illness. But it's okay to do both. And even uh, the course itself says that it's okay for you to do both, you know, rather than uh, just using the mind. When you're you know, on the same level that Jesus is, then you'll be able to use your mind uh, to heal anything. Your body, other people's bodies, even though the body isn't real, uh, he knew how to look at it. And uh, when you're on his level, yes, you will be able to heal uh, without exception. But until you're there, you know, it's okay uh, to do both. And that idea of being normal, I think, applies to just about anything because uh, the course does not ask us to give up our lives. You know, you can still have your life. You can still have all the normal things that you would have had anyway. Uh, what the Course is asking us to do is to look at it differently. You know, asking us to look at it with the Holy Spirit instead of the ego, to try to be above the battleground, as the Course puts it. And you can do both at the same time. You can have your life. In fact, I think that for the Course, and gee, maybe you've said this, uh, Judy, but for the Course, uh, to be given in a place like New York City, which is the epitome of complexity and uh, ego-minded things, uh, for the course to be given there almost was saying to us, look, 
Uh, you don't have to escape physically uh, from the world. You don't have to go live on a mountaintop in Tibet for 30 years uh, in order to be enlightened. You can use the things that are right there in front of your face to attain enlightenment. And it's all about how you're looking at them and whether or not you're practicing true forgiveness. And if you are, then it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, you can apply this to anything and anybody. And in fact, those lessons that are right there in front of your face are the things that you're supposed to apply the course to. And they're the people that you're supposed to meet. And they're the people that you're supposed to use this forgiveness on. So, uh, you know, I'm going to use what you said about expecting nothing and simply practicing uh, forgiveness because that uh, not only leads to peace, but I think it also leads you to love. Because the more you undo the ego, the more you experience what you are. And yeah, yeah. I, I think that that is so apt and true. And um, I feel very optimistic about that, which we call us. <laughs> yeah. Us. Because the more people who gently awaken to the thought that there must be a better way than this, and I'm going to try to find it. They're going to find it. They're going to find a way for them. It may not be A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles is only one of many. But since that's the one we're talking about now, there are many ways people get led to the material they need or the teacher they need, the opportunity they need. I think the first step is recognizing you have a problem. And the second step is knowing to ask for higher help because we cannot do it alone. And if we think we can, we're making one of the biggest mistakes that goes on and on in perpetuity. We cannot do it alone. But if we dare to say, what's ever there, <laughs> whoever you are, <laughs> whether you're inside of me, you're above me, outside of me, around me, I don't know. I am very aware there's something more than myself alone. Please help me. I am ready. And the amount of willingness is not necessarily determined. The amount of willingness is how much you bring to it. How fast or how much do you want to be able to change? And do you have a pretty good idea of what you want to change into? You can always be sure that your answer is a good one to yourself in correctness through the Holy Spirit is the peace of God. Who does not want peace? Who does not want love? Everybody in the room who does not want love, raise your hand. <laughs> you know? It's absurd. We may not know how to ask it. We may think we're unworthy of it, but we still want love and we're entitled to it is what the Course is telling us. We're entitled to love because of who we are. Who we are is love, and we need to awaken to it. And we're given, if you like, the prescription or the guidebook or the how-to book, exactly how to find it. Yes, yes, uh, that is so true. And you know, one of the things I emphasize to people is, uh, you know, remember to practice every day. Uh, make the most of it. You know, it's like uh, if you want to be a good piano player. There's only one thing in the world that's going to make you a good piano player. And that's if you sit there every day and practice. And the more you practice, the better you'll get at it. At first, uh, your fingers don't know where to go. But if you practice every day for a couple of years, you do know what to do. And it does get easier. And I think that you can get uh, so good and so fast at practicing forgiveness that something happens, you forgive it, it's over. Uh, this can be done in, in just a second or two. And uh, you don't have to you know, spend all day on it. Uh, you can get to the point where you can do it very fast, just like the piano player becomes very fast. And uh, there's only one thing that's going to get you there, and that's practice. Uh, the other thing that I've been emphasizing lately is the bigness of A Course in Miracles. This is a very big uh, teaching, and it's not always uh, taught that way. And uh, you, know, you look at parts of the, of the course in the magnitude of it. Uh, for example, if you don't mind, I just want to take like one or two minutes and recite one thing from the course that I know that you're familiar with. And uh, I believe it was one of Helen's favorite parts uh, of the course from uh, The Forgotten Swan. And uh, I memorized it because it's just so important to me. 
to really get the scope of what we're talking about when we finally engage in what the Course calls vision. Uh, my teachers called it spiritual sight, but it means the same thing, uh, you know, the vision of the Son of God. Uh, that section in Forgotten Song, I'll just like recite a couple of uh, paragraphs from it. Uh, it starts off by saying, uh, beyond the body, beyond the sun and stars, past everything that you see, and yet somehow familiar, is an arc of golden light that stretches as you look into a great and shining circle. And all the circle fills with light before your eyes. The edges of the circle disappear. And what is in it is no longer contained at all. The light expands and covers everything, extending to infinity, forever shining and with no break or limit anywhere. Within it, everything is joined in perfect continuity, nor is it possible to imagine that anything could be outside, for there is nowhere that this light is not. This is the vision of the Son of God, whom you know well. Here is the sight of him who knows his Father. Here is the memory of what you are. That section concludes by saying, what is a miracle but this remembering? And who is there in whom this memory lies not? The light in one awakens it in all. And when you see it in your brother, you are remembering for everyone. And oh. I, when I think of that, it just reminds me, uh, you know, you've got to think big because that person is not a person that you're forgiving. That person is something that is bigger than the universe of time and space. You know, something that can't even be contained by the universe of time and space. And when you think of that person as being the perfect creation of God, that they really are exactly the same as God, that uh, awareness of perfect oneness that the Course describes heaven as, uh, when you remember that, you are remembering for everyone because every mind is joined, but you're most of all remembering for yourself because it really is true that as you see him, you will see yourself. So I, I just remind people, look, don't forget how big a teaching this is. Gary, you have just quoted and beautifully read by heart what I have hanging on my bedroom door. <laughs> and it has always been my favorite since I first came across it. But then, as you say, I think it is my favorite and hopefully perhaps other people's too, because it takes us beyond what we think of as this very small, puny life yeah. into something that is enormously welcoming, loving, and is our identity. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wonder so, if now... If I could read something from Disappearance, Gary, and I could ask you to comment on it, if that's okay. Sure. That'd be great. Okay. So on page 248 yeah. in the uh, paperback of Disappearance of the Universe, there's a passage that is, any kind of upset from a mild discomfort to outright anger is a warning sign. It tells you that your hidden guilt is rising up from the recesses of your unconscious mind and coming to the surface. Think of that discomfort as the guilt that needs to be released by forgiving the symbol you associate with it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, you know, that was a bad page. But, uh, <laughs> okay, I, I have to admit, I heard Ken tell that joke once. So someone quoted something from one of his books, and he just said, oh, that was a bad page, forget it. But uh, actually, that reminds me of, of so many things that the Course says, like... Uh, for example, the secret sins and hidden hates that the Course talks about at the end in uh, Choose Once Again. And it says things like uh, about the teacher of God, what he sees is his own guilt seen as being outside of him. So uh, I try to remember that whenever I, if I was forgiving something from uh, the past, somebody yelling at me or, or something. And I realized, wait a minute, that was not what it seemed. You know, what I was seeing was my own guilt uh, visualize as being outside of me, but nothing is outside of me. Because as the Course says, you know, ideas leave not their source. So that idea is still there, 
uh, in the mind waiting to be released, uh, waiting to be forgiven. And if you can uh, find it within yourself to forgive that person and remember that these people that you're seeing are not real people. You know, and I hesitate to say that sometimes because people look at me like I have two heads, but uh, what they are, according to the Course, are images. And the Course practically concludes by saying, uh, the images you make cannot prevail against what God himself would have you be. You know, so you got to remember that and, and you're forgiving them, not because they really just did what they appeared to do, but because it's your projection, you made it up. And the Course, of, of course, says that in a thousand different ways. You know, what if you realize this world is a hallucination? You know, what if you really understood that you made it up? You know, what if you recognize that all of those who appear to walk about in it and attack and murder and destroy themselves are wholly unreal? You know, they're completely unreal. And I grant you that's a pretty far out teaching for some people to swallow at first, but it is what the Course is saying. And I try to stick to what the Course is saying. So these are not real people. These are images that you have made. Just like uh, in the early workbook lesson, my thoughts are images uh, that I have made. And a lot of those early workbook lessons are pretty advanced. And uh, I think that this is just something that you have to pick up over a period of years. I don't think anybody gets the whole thing right away. But uh, if you are determined, and if you really do want the peace of God, then you'll not only understand the course intellectually eventually, but you'll actually apply it to everything that you can think that you need to apply it to. And when you actually practice, that's when you make progress. Uh, you know, the course is not an entertainment. It's not something that uh, you can impress your friends with, with your knowledge of it uh, at the study group. You know, it, it's something that you apply to the people <laughs> at the study group. And if you do that, then you're doing A Course in Miracles. And if you're practicing forgiveness, the way the course teaches it, then you're doing the course. And if you're not doing that, then you're not doing the course. And uh, I think that uh, we have to remind ourselves to do it every day. You know, it's like you said this a little before, Gary, but it comes up again. And and I think you get many questions of the sort. We do too. Um, why does it take so long? Why I've been studying the course for 14 years now and my life doesn't seem so very different. I won't give it up because I really feel it's for me. I said, but by the way, do you do you practice a sport? Oh yeah, I'm a runner. Uh, do you run every day? Well, I run in marathons, so sure, I practice every day. How much do you practice while I run five to ten miles for warm up? And I don't know, a few hours. And I said, now, how much time do you give the practice of the course a day? And then there's <laughs> silence, and the course is the Olympics of the mind. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, that's what it's all about, is the practicing. You know, and, uh, you know, like those words, I want the peace of God. You know, to say these words is nothing. But to mean these words is everything. Yeah. And the only way that I can think of to really show that you mean it is to really practice and uh, to really do it. And uh, is it the most important thing in your life? I think it's become the most important thing in my life. And people assume that it's uh, writing or speaking or things like that. But no, actually doing the course is the most important thing. And uh, maybe that's why I haven't written more books, <laughs> because I've uh, spent a lot of my time just trying to uh, do this. And uh, the more I do it, the better I get at it. But the reason that it takes so long, I think, is because just like the Course says, uh, you, you do not have to worry about being suddenly hurled into uh, reality. You know, uh, a caterpillar doesn't become a butterfly overnight. You have to be prepared for a higher life form. And uh, being spirit is not the same thing as being a body. Uh, it's a totally different experience, and you have to be ready for it. You have to be prepared for it. And you have to be willing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I was saying that, you know, a caterpillar doesn't become a butterfly overnight. Right. You have to be prepared for a higher life form and spirit is a is a life form that has no form and it it really is a, a totally different way of being if you've been fortunate enough to experience what the course calls revelation where you actually experience your perfect oneness with god then you realize that it's not like this <laughs> it's not like the world it's uh, totally different and so i think that we are prepared very gradually for it and we think a lifetime takes a long time well in the overall scheme of things, not really. 
you know, it's not really that long a time. It just seems it because we're used to thinking that way. So uh, I would say to people, look, uh, keep on doing the ego and keep getting used to the fact that you're not a body. And you may find that maybe your body will start to feel lighter. You know, maybe it will start to feel more like the figure in a dream that it really is instead of something that you have to really carry around. And uh, your experience will, I believe, start to change. And yes, it does take a long time, but I think that that's necessary because as the Course says, uh, you might be surprised at how different reality is from what you're experiencing here. And you have to be prepared for it. And it's as you mentioned before, Gary, you really need to be willing. Although the Course does say show the slightest willingness but the slightest willingness very quickly becomes more and more and more and more. And willingness or intentionality is pivotal. What a great conversation, Gary. Thanks so much for joining Judy and I. Judy, before we close, is there anything you want to ask, comment, questions for Gary? Oh, my mind is spinning, but I think we covered a lot. And as long as we make sure we give the listeners a way to find Gary's books and learn more about his writings and other people's, it would be wonderful. Yeah, Gary, please tell us how, how listeners can, how can they find your books and how can they find you online? Oh, sure. You, uh, you can just go to my website, which is GaryRenard.com. No, Gary R. Renard, just GaryRenard.com. Uh, I thought of the name for the website myself. So uh, people can go there. <laughs> great, great, great. And, uh, you'll find all kinds of uh, information on the various uh, pages. And uh, yeah, I've mean, got all my books there, recordings, uh, in my speaking schedule. And we do have a few things now uh, lined up. We're gradually starting to get back into that. I don't know if I'll ever travel as much as I did before. Uh, in fact, the reason it took me so long to write my third book was because that's all I was doing. <laughs> I was traveling all over the world. And uh, I think that my fifth book is going to get done more quickly. But that's always being updated. My uh, speaking schedule, I'm at Facebook, where I, I do post uh, occasionally. I don't do too much at Twitter because they don't allow you too much space uh, to write anything. But uh, aside from that, yeah, I would say mainly my website and Facebook and uh, Cindy's website too, uh, cindylaura.com. And uh, yeah, if they go there, they should be able to find out more than what they want to know. Well, Gary, thanks so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And thank you for your miracle voice. Well, it's been my pleasure. And uh, you know, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, Judy. It's been delightful, Gary. I've wanted to do this a long time. So this is a dream, quote unquote, come true. <laughs> Well, me too. And, uh, you know, thank you for uh, always being there, always being so kind and having me over to your house. And, and I love listening to the stories of the early days of the course. Uh, well, you know, we're very connected. We always are and always will be. So it's always a phone call or an email away. I don't do email so well anymore because my eyesight is compromised, but I'm working around it with helpers. So I'm there. Great. And uh, thank you so much. I love you guys. We love you too, Take honey. Thank, thanks for being here. Thank you. Keep on going. I will. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.